Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of this Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. One of the most dangerous times for officers is during cell extractions. Pepperball allows officers to respond with the lowest level of force and still be effective and ready if the situation escalates. The responding officer controls where the projectiles are aimed, how many projectiles are launched, and how rapidly they're deployed. This allows the response to be tailored to the moment. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in the show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. Hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Today's guest is Hugh Hurwitz. He's held multiple positions in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, including Acting Director, Assistant Director for Administration, and Assistant Director for Reentry Services. Currently, he provides consulting services and prison management, reentry, reform, and organizational change, as well as other areas. He's a member of the Council on Criminal Justice and an adjunct professor at American University in Washington, D.C. He's also a former boss of mine. So welcome to the Prison Officer Podcast, Hugh. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> we haven't seen each other in a few years, so I'm, I'm looking forward to catching up and, and actually learning a little bit about you. Uh, maybe some stuff I didn't know before. I will see what I can do about that. It's been uh, it's been a good few years. I missed you. Haven't seen you, and I think it's been almost three years. Oh yeah, yeah. So I always I always start my interviews the same way. Tell me about when you were young. Uh, what was your life like when you were young? Well, when I was young, uh, when I was and where did you grow I, up at? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so I I was uh, I moved around a little bit. I was I was actually born in Boston. Everybody asked me where are you from. Well, I, you know, I, don't have, I don't have a good answer for that because I was born in Boston, but I, I moved away. My parents moved away when I was four, uh, moved out to California. Um, we were in California, Pasadena, California, um, <clears throat> until I was in, I think I was in third grade. We moved to Chicago. And, and that's where I consider having grown up because I spent uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade and then all the way through high school. Uh, in the Chicago area. So um, I consider that's where I grew up. Um, but uh, we then, uh, I went to school, left, left Chicago, went to college at the University of Rochester in New York, and, uh, and then came to Washington uh, for law school um, at American University. And I've been in Washington uh, ever since. Excellent. So, um, what made you go into law? <laughs> what, what was it about that that excited you, uh, interested you, or? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Um, it was, it was something that was always in the back of my head. Uh, my, my dad was a lawyer, although he stopped practicing, oh, long before I can even remember. So, so mm -hmm. it's not like I grew up around it. Um, but, uh, but no, I actually went to college thinking I was going to be an economics major and uh, go to business school. And, and I took economics 101 and, I wasn't two weeks into the semester when I said, okay, I'm not going to be an economics major anymore and uh, switched, switched to political science. And, okay. um, and then, and then, you know, you know, what do you do with a political science degree? Well, you, you got to go to grad school. You got to do something, especially back then. So I uh, ended up going to law school and, uh, and by going to law school down at American, it, it opened up. Uh, that's really how I got into the Bureau of Prisons and into, into government uh, service. I came, I came to law school and after my first year of law school, you know, applied for jobs. <clears throat> so, you know, in your Washington area, you apply for lots of law firm jobs, but there's also a lot of government agencies. And I applied to every job that I could find. And, uh, and somehow I ended up getting a job at the Bureau of Prisons. So, so I clerked at the Bureau of Prisons for, for, uh, one summer, uh, during law school. 
and then stayed there. I stayed there. I were, I continued to work there during law school, um, after my, during my second year. And, uh, and then after the second year, uh, that summer between second and third year, I stayed there again and, uh, and worked there right up until I graduated. And, and then, um, and then after I graduated, I, I clerked for a year at the DC court of appeals. Um, Interesting. so I, I, I got involved and did some of that, but then, um, I applied and got accepted to the department of justice honors program and, uh, became an attorney, uh, through that program back at the bureau of prison. So I was right back to BOP again. And right. you'll hear a theme if you, you know, you know, I'll keep talking about the rest of my career, but you'll hear this kind of theme. How I, I was at BOP as a law clerk. Then I left I clerked for a year. DC Court of Appeals, and I came back to the Bureau of Prisons as an attorney. Well, I left again, and uh, I, you know, I, I really didn't. I, I wasn't sure. I wanted to try private practice. I uh, wasn't sure if that's something I wanted to do. So I left the Bureau of Prisons. I went to uh, private practice. I was doing government contracts work at the time, both at BOP and then in private practice. And I'll tell you, uh -huh. I, I was in private practice for about a week, and I said, okay. It wasn't that I didn't like POP. It was that I didn't like being a lawyer. And uh, so <laughs> I stuck that out for a few more years and uh, and then ultimately uh, went, ended up back at the Bureau of Prisons. Um, uh, this time I was in their procurement office and uh, I held several jobs in their procurement office. I started out as, as assistant chief of construction contracting, doing uh, claims work, government, you know, contracts. Uh, construction claims, uh, trying to resolve some of the disputes that they had in their construction program. I did that, and then I, I had several other positions in procurement there, and ultimately uh, ran the procurement office at the at the BOP as their as their procurement executive. And and at that point in time, you know, to be honest, I was I was faced with a, a difficult decision. I was uh, getting up there in age. I was, you know up there in age for, for BOP world, you know, I was 35, 36 years old. And, uh, you know, if I was going to go work in the field, I was running out of time. And, uh, you right. know, my boss came to me and he said, Hey, you, you know, um, you know, if you want to continue to advance your career in the Bureau of Prisons, um, you need to move out to the field and I can help you get a job out there. Um, and, you know, I thought about it at the time, you know, I was, I was married my wife had a good job. Actually, her job paid more than mine did. And uh, so she had a good job. I had two kids that had never lived anywhere else in their life and were, were, were city kids. And, you know, I wasn't sure that moving was the best thing for us at the time. So I, I said thanks and I uh, decided not to move and really gave up my opportunity, at least what I thought was my opportunity to advance my career in the Bureau of Prisons. So right. uh, that led me to start looking around uh, for promotions elsewhere. And uh, I left the Bureau of Prisons again with this common theme uh, and uh, left the Bureau of Prisons and went to the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, I ran their contracts office at, at FDA. And then I got involved in IT and I actually moved over and ran their IT shared services organization, which which uh, was kind of a unique experience for me. But uh, but IT really wasn't what I wanted to continue to do. I did, didn't mm -hmm. miss the procurement work that I was doing. So I. So I left FDA and went to the Department of Education. And at the Department of Education, I was their senior procurement executive and then ultimately was promoted to be their uh, deputy chief financial officer and uh, got exposure to some financial management and, and other things that I hadn't done before. So uh, another great opportunity uh, there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, uh, opportunities present themselves. And, and uh, a few years later, I had, a, I had an opportunity to, to move on and I became uh, the uh, assistant inspector general for management at uh, NASA. And that really was kind of at the time what I thought I wanted to do. I, I was, wow. I was, I had an opportunity there to really run the entire administrative function for an agency. So mm -hmm. in that job, I had not only contracts, and financial management that I have experience in, but also their office of technology, their facilities office, their security office, um, their human resource office. So all of the administrative functions there uh, for the NASA IG, I had that opportunity to do. So that's kind of really where I thought my career was going to go into that type of work. And that's, and that's what I wanted to do at the time. Sure. Um, but as things may be, um, I still had some contacts at the BOP. 
and an opportunity uh, presented itself to go back to BOP, this time as their uh, senior deputy assistant director in the Office of Information Policy and Public Affairs. And mm-hmm. I dare you to say that three times fast. <laughs> um, but uh, in that job, uh, I was responsible for overseeing the Office of Public Affairs, the Office of Legislative Affairs, the Policy Office, and the Office of Research. So that was really kind of a cool opportunity to get back into BOP because those offices touch everything BOP does. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because right. because everything they do there's either congressional or 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 media interest in it. Uh, it involves research programs, and of course, policy applies to everything that BOP does. So, really, had a, a broad perspective in that job. I got to work closely with the director and the director's office. I got to work closely with the Department of Justice and mm-hmm. and other components. And uh, you know, that was really kind of gave me a lot of exposure to everything that BOP was doing at that time. And there was a lot of interest in, in prisons and BOP at the time as well. Uh, sure. And then through that, I, I, I moved on from that to become the assistant director for reentry services division. And, uh, you know, the, as, as you know, the, you know, the Bureau of Prisons has, has two missions, right? One mission is to safely and securely confine offenders. And mm-hmm. the other mission is to prepare them to return to society and be successful. And, sure. and so reentry services was really, creating policy and oversight for half of the BOP's mission. And and so I, I got an opportunity to do that job um, as an executive staff member. And, you know, I thought that was just a, you know, a really great position, a great opportunity to have. Right. And then um, uh, one day I got a phone call from the uh, chief of staff to the deputy attorney general asking me to come into his office and meet with the deputy attorney general the next day. And I, and I said, well, <laughs> I've never met the deputy attorney general. That's either good or bad. I don't know. You know, am I in trouble or not? Right. And he actually said, he said, don't worry. You know, you're not in trouble. I said, okay, that's good. That's good. Um, But, but he said, I can't tell anybody what this meeting's about. So, (laughs) so, uh, so I said, okay. Um, So I show up the next day and I met with the deputy attorney general and um, uh, they uh, told me they were considering me to be the acting director of the Bureau of Prisons. And, we talked, and uh, I actually gave them a couple names of other people who I thought would be more qualified than me, <laughs> and, uh, and they they thanked me but declined that offer. And um, and then they took me up to meet the attorney general, and I'd never met the attorney general before either. And right. uh, and ultimately, they they asked me to be the uh, acting director of the Bureau of Prisons, which I did for uh, for fifteen months. And, yeah, it was uh, quite a while. Best best job I ever had, and. Uh, Really got to work with a lot of great people at the Bureau of Prisons and uh, mm. really, truly enjoyed that work. And then um, uh, some news broke. I had a lot of a lot of interesting things happen while I was in that job. Um, but obviously the big one that everybody remembers for, for not good things is uh, um, uh, Jeff Epstein uh, killed wow. himself. And, yep. uh, and uh, then the Attorney General decided that... Uh, he needed to go a different direction and um, returned me back to my old job in reentry services division. And uh, I did that for a few months. And then uh, the director at the time asked me uh, to, to transfer over to be the assistant director for administration. And I mm-hmm. did that for, uh, for uh, about eight months, I think it was. And then, uh, and then I retired in, in March of 21. And uh, um, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I retired, but I, right, I, right. I, I will tell you, I truly miss the people at the Bureau of Prisons, and uh, and uh, no no day is boring in that job, that is for sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it sounds like you had, and you see this as a common theme amongst a lot of people that work in the uh, prison system, and especially the Bureau of Prisons, because we have so many opportunities, but uh, I know a cook who came in as a cook and uh, became a captain when he retired, you know? I know I just talked the other day to an IT guy who started off as a tech, and now he's an AW. Uh, so a lot of people find out when they come in, you know, this is what I thought I wanted, but look at this opportunity here. Look at that opportunity. And it looks like you took advantage of that also. Well, you know, let me tell you, I, I've said this to a, a number of people before. The, the Bureau of Prisons, one of the best things, what you just said is one of the best things about the Bureau of Prisons, and it's also one of the worst things. 
Uh, mm. and, and let me explain. Sure. It is There is no other agency in government where you can come in at GS5 and work your way up in that agency to be mm-hmm. at the top of the agency. Um, yep. you, can, you can start out as, as a correctional officer and then decide you want to get into human resources or financial management, and the opportunity is there. Uh, you want to get into IT, you can do that. You can do anything you want in the Bureau of Prisons. And there's, again, no other agency can you do that. And right. I've worked at several, right? You cannot <laughs> do that anywhere else. Just start at, 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 at entry level and then become anything you want in that agency. And yep. that's that tremendous opportunity for people. And like I said, that's one of the best things about the agency. It also is one of the things that, that is a challenge for them because – what ends up happening is, and use my example, right? Somebody comes in at whatever position they come in at, and then they move to HR, uh, for mm-hmm. example. And and this could apply to any discipline. So I'm not picking on HR, but you can move to HR. So what happens? Well, now you you don't you're taught HR by um, by people in the Bureau of Prisons and how they do HR in the Bureau of Prisons, mm-hmm. and then. You move up and you haven't been exposed to HR anywhere else and you don't know how else it's done. And now you've moved up to a position and now you're training people and you're training them the way you learn. And and nobody comes in from outside at mid-level to say, hey, wait, there's other ways to do things. We right. used to do HR differently here. Or we used to do contracting differently here or whatever the function is, right? There's other ways to do it. And and we don't know that in the Bureau of Prisons, right? Because we only know the way we've so. always done it, the way we've always been taught it. So that that is sometimes a hindrance for BOP, particularly in some of the administrative or management functions, that, that they don't really know there's other ways to do things. Right. And um, and that's a challenge. So, so you know, and the Bureau has gotten a lot better lately, I think, at, at balancing that by promoting mm-hmm. people from within, but also bring in some people in from outside that say, hey, wait, why do you do it that way? Because, you know, things have changed and you could do it differently. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, hopefully they're learning and I think they're getting better at it now as well. But that, that yeah. I, I still believe that's the best thing about the Bureau of Prisons is you can do whatever you want to do. Oh, absolutely. I, and I'm I'm an example of what you're talking about. I started off as a correctional officer, ended up as a, a chief working in Washington, D.C. with a with a high school diploma. Um, so, you know, the, 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 back when you were was- working yeah, in Washington. Yep. Absolutely. And like you said, it's also, and I, I spoke about this several times, <clears throat> we tend to teach ourselves. Um, you know, if you've got a corporation out there in this country, a company with 35,000 employees, Tony Robbins is going to come in and, and, you know, he's going to talk to some of the men, but we don't do that. We have captains teaching lieutenants and, you know, wardens teaching captains. And so we keep that. Sometimes those bad habits uh, flourish because of that, but you're absolutely right. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today, and you were kind of there uh, for a big part of this, but reentry, reentry is uh, something that, um, I haven't talked about a whole lot on this podcast, but it's something that's very important to everybody. And one of the things that happened, I believe, while you were in the job was the First Step Act, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. First Step Act was uh, was signed by President Trump uh, while I was acting director. One of the only bipartisan things, I think, that went through during that presidency, you know, and it was uh, everybody was behind it. Um, so tell me a little bit about what that was like when... Because that just kind of came down to us. They said, you guys are going to do this. And tell us a little bit about the First Step Act and what was expected out of reentry for that. So that was, you know, that was an interesting time at BOP because, um, you know, there was this uh, uh, ongoing debate about this proposed bill, the First Step Act. And and um, um, a lot of people remember, if you read the newspapers, you know, you'll see a lot of people uh see that, you know, Jared Kushner, who worked in the White House with the president, his, his son-in-law, was very involved in the First Step Act. And, right. and you know, that came from, a, uh, I think his interest came from uh, his own personal experience. His father had been incarcerated at the Bureau of Prisons. And, and, uh, and, and so I think, you know, I'm sure through that experience, he met a lot of people um, 
who had spent time in, 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 in the Bureau of Prisons and incarcerated and, um, you know, looking for ways to, to change the prison system. And this, and this really, you know, understand that the first step back only applies to the federal Bureau of Prisons because right. you know, Congress can only pass laws that affect federal prisons where, you know, most of the prisons and, and most of the people that are incarcerated in this country are in state prisons. I mean, there's almost 2 mm. million people incarcerated in the United States today, there's about 150,000, 160,000 in the Bureau of Prisons. So yeah. the vast, vast majority of people that are incarcerated um, are in state and local prisons across the country. I think country. I looked, or last I looked, we were at like 10 or 11 percent of yeah, the Bureau of Prisons. Yeah. That's right. So. Like I said, there's, there's just under 2 million people today, and mm -hmm. we're about 150,000. So, you know, it's, it's really um, a small percentage and the first step back doesn't get to most of those people, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, because it only applies to the Congress can only pass laws that apply to the to the federal government. And uh, and so one of the things I think they thought they're hoping to see is that some of the changes in the first step back get replicated at the state level, and we're and we're seeing some of that some of that today. But um, the whole work around getting the first step back passed, there was a, there was a lot of uh, negotiations. It almost didn't pass at various times. It was very difficult because remember, even the Congress back then was was divided like it is mm -hmm. today. Um, and, uh, um, you know, getting any kind of bipartisan legislation passed has been difficult the last several years. And, and, sure. and it was no different at the time during the First Step Act. So, but there was a lot of organizations, um, a lot of people that were involved in, in, in this, it was actually a film I just saw recently called "The First Step," and and that that kind of highlights that. the relationship between um, uh, Jared Kushner and and Van Jones, uh, the CNN reporter and 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 uh, political activist. So it uh, they it had it created an unlikely relationship, right? Right. And, uh, and they were they were two key people um, in passing the law, and there's other organizations. Um, Many, many other organizations that that were involved in in getting the first step back passed, the Tzedek Association and, and the Aleph Institute and, and others were all very uh, active and and working behind the scenes to get to get the first step back, and and so it was finally was passed and the president signed it in in uh, uh, December of eighteen, I guess it was, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's interesting he signed it right in the middle of a government shutdown. And, uh, you know, here, here we were, um, you know, shut down. And I, you know, that's one of the, one of the, one of the odd, you know, types of experiences I had happen to be director during that time of the government shutdown, which by itself was a huge challenge. And we can, sure. we can talk about that some as well, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the first step back was signed and it was nobody in the office to talk about it. We were, all, we were all shut down. Right. And, uh, but anyway, the, the long and the short of it is the First Step Act really was, for those that don't know, was intended to do a couple of things, right? One was to, to reduce the federal prison population, to find ways to get um, people out of prison. We, had, you know, Like I said, the prisons were overcrowded. They had a lot of, uh, at the time, we were approaching 200,000. I think the Bureau of Prisons actually peak was about 220,000. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but we were, we were, you know, close to 200,000 people in the, in the Bureau of Prisons, 180,000, I think. And, and, uh, so the idea was to reduce the prison population in a safe way. And so how do we do that? We find certain people that, uh, you know, are considered low risk to the community and let's get those low risk people, uh, mm. out of our prison system. And, yeah. and, uh, it created a series of incentives for, people to take uh, what they call evidence-based recidivism reducing programs or productive activities, which, which uh, are maybe not productive activities are, are similar types of programs, but they don't have the actual evidence behind them to show right. that they're actually reducing recidivism. Um, so, you know, the idea behind the first step back was that, that it would incentivize people to take uh, these programs and uh, things that would, people encourage would be assessed Things that would encourage positive yeah. change in them is kind of what it was right, looking right. for. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Things that, you know, look, we have, you know, in this country, and again, the Bureau of Prisons is probably a little bit better than most of the states. Again, why this is interesting 
because this is applying to the Federal Bureau of Prisons when really the bigger problems were in many of the states. Uh, mm -hmm. Many states had a recidivism rate of over 50 percent. Sure. And, you know, the Bureau of Prisons recidivism rate was somewhere in the 30s at the time, 36 uh, percent maybe. Um, right. Yeah. And so, you know, a, a, not a great recidivism rate, but certainly better than most of the states and certainly better than most of the larger states. Um, but if you think about that, remember what I said before was, you know, I talked about the Bureau of Prisons and, and two missions, right? One mission was to safely confine offenders. The other one is to prepare people to return to society. Well, if that's the mission of all of our prisons in this country, and mm -hmm. the majority of the prisons in this country have a recidivism rate of 50 percent, I mean, you, it's hard to argue that your prisons are being successful in carrying out that mission. Right. right. I mean, right. I don't know too many other businesses. Uh, <laughs> Or, or any function or anything that would be satisfied with a 50% failure rate. Oh, absolutely uh, not. And, and so, you know, clearly if, if that's where your recidivism rate is, is heading, um, you know, we need to do a better job in this country of preparing people to return to society because, um, you know, that's not acceptable. And 95% of the people in our prisons are coming home. 95% are going to be our neighbors. And mm -hmm. so, you know, all of all of us citizens, we want people to be successful when they come out of prison because we don't want crime in our neighborhoods. And right. um, so, you know, with those kind of recidivism rates, it's it's really imperative that we do what we can to try and, you know, reduce recidivism and prepare people for returning to society. So that's really kind of the, the idea behind the first step back was we're right. going to provide more programming for people um, so that that they will be more likely to succeed uh, when they come home. Sure. And I'm always torn um, personally with this because um, I, I do have some thoughts that are, are different sometimes. And, and in the First Step Act, it, it mentions uh, crimogenic environment several times. That's what they talk about. And it's almost that the First Step Act wants to say that environments cause um, criminality. And in some instances i agree with that but choices do too and self-accountability has got to be there and so and i don't think i'm alone in the the public expects that too they want a certain amount now there's a certain amount of the public that just want retribution <laughs> you know you you did something wrong you're going to pay for it but i think we're pretty much past that but i do want self-accountability i want someone to prove that they're ready to go back out into society and one thing that those assessments did, I know you guys spent a lot of time building those risk assessments. Um, and I don't think the general public knows that we weren't just trying to let everybody out of prison. We were going after very specific uh, inmates who met certain criteria, who were, you know, the, the had the greatest chance of, you know, doing something positive and staying out. Um, would, would you agree with that statement as far yeah, as the no, risk assessments? No, a hundred percent. And, and, and it's interesting because we had, you know, we were challenged with creating a new risk assessment tool that was part of the First Step Act. And, mm -hmm. and actually, DOJ um, uh, and the National Institute of Justice, they really led that, right? BOP okay. was, was along for the ride, right? It was the, the, <laughs> the, the, the department didn't allow us to create our own risk assessment tool. As a matter of fact, we had a tool. We had a tool that was called Bravo. And, uh -huh. and BOP used that tool to assess the, the likelihood of institutional misconduct, right? Mm -hmm. And and we, we use that to help figure out, you know, what security level people should be placed at and and what their risk of, 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 of uh, misconduct would be. And it turns out that the risk of institutional misconduct was really very, very, very similar to the risk of recidivism. And, and so our tool, you know, we would have been satisfied using our tool um, because we thought it worked. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't have been acceptable to anybody that passed the First Step Act because their idea was, let's change BOP, not use the same tools that they already have. So, sure, sure. you know, DOJ went through quite a lengthy process, uh, hired some uh, academics and a number of other folks to work on creating this tool that ultimately was called Pattern. And... I don't even remember what the acronym stands for, right. but, but it's a long acronym. And, and it is a, a uh, recidivism uh, risk assessment tool. And what's interesting is it is 
incrementally different results than Bravo. Almost the exact same. I mean, as a matter of fact, I think when you look at the different tools that are out there for measuring recidivism risk, you'll find that well, pattern we believe is probably the most accurate and the best tool available. Uh, mm-hmm. Bravo is like right there next to it. And then there's other okay. tools that are further down the line. So that was pretty satisfying to us at the Bureau of Prisons anyway, that, you know, the tool we were using for assessing uh, misconduct was, was a very good tool. But now they use pattern for this risk assessment uh, mm-hmm. process in the Bureau of Prisons. And and the idea behind it is, is you know, you, you mentioned this, this concept of, of accountability. Well, that's, you know, those are some of the programs that that people are expected to take right and to mm-hmm. help them learn and to be accountable for their own actions and and to get, provide people those those tools so that they can do that and be successful when they come home and that's that's among the many different programs that have been put in place sure in sure Bureau. and i've worked you know i've worked everywhere from a work release camp which i saw some some amazing successes at of course you're dealing with lower level offenders at that point but you were giving them skills, uh, teaching them how to, you know, go out and get a job. Matter of fact, I just, I just saw an article, and it was about Greenville and Pekin, and they, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes here because it's about some female inmates who they brought over and for the first time took them through um, uh, job training and and through doing interviews and dressing them up a a. A uh, volunteer area came out and said, here, we'll buy the clothes so that you can show up at these and be presentable. And one of the things that got me was one of the ladies said, number one, she'd never interviewed for a job. And she didn't say how old she was, but I'm I'm guessing mid-30s at least. And she said she'd never sat down and applied for a job like that. And she had never worn a suit like that uh, to an interview. And I'm thinking, you know, that's so basic for a lot of people to think this is how I go get a job. But some people never saw that. So I really see some uh, positives that come out of it in that way. Uh, when we're when we're actually putting boots on the ground and teaching people how to change. That's what I love seeing. Um, you know, sitting around in a classroom sometimes with a book and everybody's disinterested, which I've also seen, doesn't cause as much change sometimes, in my opinion. But what are some of the positive changes that you saw come out of this? Well, you know, and you talk about that. You, know, you see more and more people understanding adult learning today, right? Mm. When you know the adults don't learn very well from sitting in a classroom with a book, and you know, to some extent, you need to do that. But um, you know, the more programs you can put in place for dealing with adults in, that are hands-on, give them real life experiences, um, you know, gives them. Really, it helps to learn. I think the adult brain learns better that way. And so we see more and more of that. And, and hopefully some of these programs that they're putting in place are more like that rather than just handing somebody a book. Um, yeah. And most of the programs involve people coming in and talking about their experiences and giving people opportunities, like you said, to to do to practice interviews in, in job skills courses yeah. and things like that. Parenting courses, they they have programs where people, you know, can you know learn how to be parents and it's not just reading a book there's there's other tools and things they can bring in i even saw one where they had dolls that they were using i yes. don't think they use that anymore but <laughs> but even that you know just different ways of, of giving people some exposure and some experience yeah uh, all works really well. yeah i know you talked about that we were kind of setting the example for some of these state agencies there's also a and it's mentioned in the First Step Act, the Second Chance Act, which has been around for, I think, 10 years. And that's federal money that I believe goes out to those state agencies and, and other agencies so that they can do some of this reentry stuff. Um, have you seen any impact from it? Or Yeah, and as a matter of fact, even under the First Step Act now, I've seen um, a BOP doesn't give grants. They're, they're not a grant-making right, agency. Right. But, it's DOJ, uh, I believe. Masters to the Justice, DOJ has that authority. And, and mm-hmm. other agencies do as well. As a matter of fact, I just saw uh, a, 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 a DOJ Department of Labor joint effort using First Step Act money, where they are giving states money to uh, bring in uh, educational and um, job training programs into prisons 
in, mm-hmm. the, fed, in the federal prisons in the states. So, right. so different states got grant money from this DOJ DOL um, combined effort. And they're now able to to apply. And then they're approaching BOP facilities with, hey, here's a job training program that we got funded through the First Step Act that we're going to offer to your program, your institutions in the oh, BOP. So there's a number of different programs like that that are going on out there, which are which are really cool. And it's good to see that. Um, I, I will say that I think as a whole, you know, the First Step Act, you know, I touched on this, right? Did the First Step Act do what it was supposed to do? Um, you know, I, I think they, they were very successful at reducing prison population. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people have been released under the first step act. And, um, and so from that perspective, it's been very successful, but we talked about, you know, risk levels, um, and, and who the first step act, um, you know, allows to be able to get, um, Time credits and time credits is really the big incentive under the first step back, right? What do they do? People can earn time credits under the first step back by taking these recidivism reducing programs and then they can earn time that actually reduces their sentence and they can mm-hmm. be released to supervise released earlier than they would otherwise up to a year early or they can go to and they can go to a halfway house earlier than they normally would. And, you know, there's not a lot of ways in because parole is abolished at the federal system. There's not a lot of ways for people to reduce their sentence, right? You basically, before the first step back, you can reduce your sentence by good conduct. And and it's a statutory amount of time. Uh, You could earn up to uh, a year early to a halfway, uh, up to a year early on by taking the RDAP program. Again, that was constantly statutory. And then, and then, you know, you you could get, you know, um, clemency by the president or compassionate release. And those right. are very, very rare. So right. there really wasn't any ways to very few ways to reduce your sentence. And so the first step back came around and provided this extra new way of getting people to reduce their sentence. Um, but one of the challenges in the first step back is because it was so the politics behind it. And it was, again, you know, like I said, we talked about this, right? There was a a divided Congress and a, a mm-hmm. very difficult to get any kind of a bipartisan action. Um, uh, the idea behind the first step back was to allow people to, to get released earlier. Um, that, that didn't play well with some, you know, political factions in the, in the country. And, and so they, they had to find a way to balance that and, and to compromise. And, and ultimately what they did was, they, they said it was a whole bunch of crimes that you could be committed, uh, that you can, may have committed that are violent in nature. And therefore you'd be ineligible to use those time credits to get early release. Mm. And, and about half the people in the Bureau of Prisons are actually ineligible because of sure. the sentence that they, that, that they were convicted of. And, um, what the law did was it decided that people that are, if they're determined to be minimum or low risk of recidivating, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to go through that pattern score and be minimum or low risk of recidivating. If you're low risk of recidivating or minimum risk of recidivating and you don't have one of those excluded crimes, then if you take those programs, you could earn time credits to be to be released early. Right. And you know, that's resulted in a lot of people getting released from prison. But to me, that really isn't doing anything. Right. Right. Because the, the people that are minimum, if you're minimum or low risk of recidivating by definition, then you don't <laughs> need the programs that are recidivism reducing programs because you're already minimum or low risk of recidivating. Sure. And so what we're doing is incentivizing those people that don't need the programs to take the programs. Mm-hmm. And then those people that are high risk of recidivating aren't getting the same incentives to take those programs. So right. there's no incentive for them to take the program because doesn't help them and um and quite frankly the people that are minimum or low risk are filling up all the spaces anyway so <laughs> even those high risk ones that probably wanted to take it may not right. be able to because the low the low risk people are filling up the spaces so that to me is one of the challenges of the first step back and, and why i think you know congress needs to take another look at what other incentives they can authorize to encourage those people that are high risk because again the goal is 95% of people are coming home. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're high risk or low risk. You're coming home. Yep. And, and, you know, we want you to be successful. So we need to find ways to ensure that those high risk people, and I'm not saying that that means they have to get out of prison early. There are other ways to incentivize them. We need to figure out what those other ways to incentivize them are so that those people that are high risk will take these programs and will be sure. more likely to succeed when they come out. Sure. And it's so not, and I think a lot of people don't know. That's one of the areas that, no, but go ahead. No, I think that's one of the areas that people don't understand. It's not just about uh, reentry. If you've got inmates who have classes to go to, who are working hard, who are taking, you know, developing self accountability, who are working towards a goal, those are safer inmates on the inside, you know, and, and so it, it plays not only to um, the public at large, but it plays to the staff inside also when we can do that. I know you had a, a article recently on uh, published with the Hill, and uh, it says the First Step Act was only half the job. Now a second step is needed. Is that kind of what you're alluding to there? We yeah, need to take that second step. I think we need to have Congress needs to take this second step and and figure out what incentives they can they can they can authorize that are beyond what BOP can already do. Look, BOP can do certain things, but mm-hmm. but uh, you know to make it really meaningful. Um, Congress needs to act and find a way to incentivize those people that are that are medium or high risk to take the same recidivism reducing programs. Right. Um, there's a lot of money available under the First Step Act. Excuse me for the Bureau of Prisons to to put in place these programs. So I think they've they've got the resources to put in place the programs. Bureau of Prisons needs more staff. I mean, that's quite frankly where yeah. the biggest challenge is. Whether right there's now, a first yeah. step only or there's a second step, at the end of the day, um, if the Bureau of Prisons doesn't have the people to carry out these programs, um, then that's going to be a challenge. And they have the money yeah. to do that. But, you know, quite frankly, uh, prison systems across the country uh, at all levels are, are hurting for staff. And I'm sure yeah. you've talked about that on your on your podcast. But I was just at the ACA uh, uh two months ago and Mm -hmm. uh, the American Correctional Association conference. And I talked to some state corrections directors and to some presidents of private prison companies and asked them all about their, their staffing. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they, they're all having huge trouble. I mean, you know, the the private prisons are having difficulties. The states, there isn't a single state that I spoke to that didn't have trouble hiring staff and retaining staff. And the Bureau of Prisons is having the same problem. So it isn't, it isn't like they're not trying. They're all trying, but they're all trying for the same group of people. And right. <laughs> let's face it, a lot of people don't want to, you know, kind of, you know, the taxpayers don't want to pay, uh, you know, higher salaries. They don't. They don't have the money. Yeah. The taxes, you know, that our, our budgets aren't are that big that we have, you know, unlimited funds. So we need more funds to hire and pay more money. Um, yeah. Prisons, quite frankly, are not always in the most desirable neighborhoods. I mean, yeah. many of them are are in uh, more rural areas where there aren't the resources and the tools for the, for the staff and, and to, to come and have and raise families and things because, you know, nobody wants prisons in, in, in their backyard. And on top of that, yeah. land is too expensive in metropolitan areas. So even if they were to put it in their backyard, it's, it's not a good use of this space. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's very difficult and we could talk for a long time about, staffing challenges but every mm. every agency in the country is having these problems and uh yeah. and i don't know how to solve that but that's that's a big challenge yeah i, I don't have the um uh, answer for how to solve it uh, but i will say it is one of the best times to go into corrections and that's why i wrote uh, my recent book with the prison officer podcast job guide because there are so many bonuses and, and salaries are going up just every day so for a person who wants to work in corrections, to be able to look at all those different agencies and see um, what's the best fit for them, where where they can go. So um, I'll put a link to that in the notes also. But it it is the time for people that want to work in corrections. The, the sky's the limit right now. Um, it goes back to what we said at the beginning, too, right? Mm-hmm. That, yep. that absolutely not only are there many, many, like if you want a job in corrections, they're there. The mm-hmm. feds are hiring, the states are hiring, the local sheriffs are hiring, the private prisons are hiring. Everybody's hiring. 
and yep. and the jobs are available. You can pick and choose which ones you want. And as we said before, what an opportunity because you work in the prison system. Then once you're in, you can move up and go into pretty much any kind of career you want to have. So Absolutely. I just think, you know, it's not only is it a great career, but I think you're 100 percent correct. There is no better time than now to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've had a long career. Uh, thank you for talking to, uh, about the First Step Act with us, but I want to hear a little bit more because I know you've been in some of the top leadership positions, and especially in the Bureau. Um, what were some of the top challenges you had that you had to work through as a leader? Um, and what was some advice that you might have for other leaders? Boy, that's it. That's, you know, there is just, I was just thinking about this. Uh, you know, I was acting director for 15 months and so just focusing on that job alone, not even talking about the rest of my career, but just uh -huh. for a moment thinking about the 15 months that I was acting director, the different crises and events that, that I was involved in and led the agency through. Um, I was the director when, and I'll just rattle a few off and we come back to some of these, but I was the sure. director when Whitey Bulger was murdered. Yep. Uh, uh, I, I was director when uh, Hurricane Michael hit down in Florida. It damaged three prisons. We, we closed Mariana um, mm. and, and then had to rebuild it. Uh, right. As I said before, I was director through the government shutdown. And, you know, the government shutdown, boy, talk about how challenging that was because for those people in D.C., the government shutdown was mostly a vacation, right? Oh, well, I can't go to work and everybody goes yep. home. But we had to keep the prisons running, right? We didn't get to shut down. Uh, yep. and, and we had to keep the prisons running while staff weren't getting paid. Um, so, again, what a huge challenge. Mm. Um, I was director when uh, the uh, institution in Brooklyn had a fire. And, and that, was led, that led to a uh, power outage in the facility. And, and, uh, we had protesters coming and I never knew there was such a thing as paid protesters. We had protesters coming. I didn't even know why they were protesting. <laughs> they were just there because somebody was paying them and giving them some, some, some food. Uh, for right. Um, uh, as we talked about, I was, I was director during the passage of the first step act. And, uh, and then ultimately I was, I was director, uh, until Epstein committed suicide. So, Right. Uh, quite a, just in the, in the 15 months as director of girl prisons. I mean, that, that was a life, I was a career, a lifetime career right there. Oh, so, absolutely. All those yeah. things. <laughs> so which one do you uh, want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what, what I, I guess what I'd like some other people to understand, you know, the bureau is so vast. We're, we're talking, I, I forget how many states, 122 <laughs> institutions, $8 billion budget. So to sit there at the top of that and try to keep information flowing the right direction, try to get information back to you to make decisions, um, how do you do some of that? You know, what, what's the, well, is there a secret? <laughs> you know, there's, there's no secret. Um, I, I will tell you that that is really one of the hardest things as a, a manager and a leader um, is, you know, you have thirties. We had, we had 36,000 staff at the Bureau of Prisons when I was doing it. Yep. And, yep. you know, obviously I couldn't be with next to or talk to 36,000 staff every day. Right. And, and, and that's really one of the biggest challenges because you have to rely on other managers and supervisors. You have to rely on everybody from the bottom of the organization to the top to do their job. And, mm -hmm. and, and let me tell you, working and meeting the people in the Bureau of Prisons through that experience, uh, I met some great people. And 99% and, and of the time, those people that I'm talking about did their jobs, did them passionately, mm -hmm. did them very well. And, 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 and I'm very proud of the work that the, the staff and the BOP accomplished every day. And, and yes. it's a very, very difficult job. Um, but there's that 1% of the people that just aren't, you know, they're going to, they're going to make a mistake or they're going to be worse and intentionally do something that they shouldn't do. Right. And, and that's really one of the challenges. It's very frustrating because you can't be everywhere. You can't make sure everybody knows what they're doing. 
and and you can't and, and you know you have to rely on on other managers, other leaders, and and uh, on all the line staff to do their work. Um, and you know, look, this su- Epstein suicide is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we were you know we we obviously knew we knew who we had in him. Um, we took went to great pains to make sure that that he was you know housed appropriately. Um, mm-hmm. I personally had conversations with the regional director and the warden, uh, and they assured me that all of the staff at the institution, everybody knew that under no circumstances was he to be single celled because he wasn't at such risk that he should have been on suicide watch. He was a, a risk, and mm-hmm. and the biggest factor for for suicide uh, contributing to suicide in prison is is being single celled. Yep. And so everybody was aware he shouldn't be single cell. And so what happened? Well, you know, on a Friday afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon, um, his cellmate was in court and was unexpectedly released by the judge. Nobody expected that. Everybody, expect, everybody expected the cellmate to come back. Mm-hmm. And uh, but what happened at five o'clock in the afternoon? The cellmate doesn't come back. Right. Because the judge let him go. And, you know, nobody in the institution said, "Uh oh, I better go find a new, I've seen a new cellmate, right? I mean, right. again, I mean, I could see how it could happen, but it shouldn't yes. have happened, right? Should. And, and somebody should have said, wait, I need to be there. Well, you know, despite all of the direction I gave, despite all of the assurances I was given, you know, mm-hmm. Unless I was physically there, I couldn't personally be 100% certain that Epstein returned from his meetings with his lawyers to his cell with a cellmate. Right. And, right. and that night, he didn't have a cellmate. And, uh, you know, so so we have that problem, right? Right. And as, as the Attorney General once said, that it was kind of a confluence of a whole bunch of mistakes and bad luck. Um you know, well, what happened? So now he's single celled, and and unfortunately, we had some staff who acknowledged that that didn't they do didn't their job. do what they were supposed to do. Absolutely, and, and you know, they they allegedly fabricated some log entries. They we we know that they were surfing the internet or sleeping, and didn't do what they were supposed to do. And, sure, and and again, you know, how does a, a leader <laughs> manager? You know, ensure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. We right. have to count on having people that are working with integrity and doing the job they're supposed to do. And, mm-hmm. you know, 99% of the time that happens. But right. this was, of course, the part of the 1% where it didn't and it had it had tragic consequences. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully that's a lesson for, for BOP staff and leaders that, you know, we, we need to, we need to, train our people properly. We need to yeah. invest in, in making sure that we train people properly. We need to invest in hiring people with only the highest levels of integrity. And and that's a challenge because, yeah. you know, you don't look, most people aren't getting hired and know, you know, Oh, that person lacks integrity. You usually yeah. don't, don't see it that obviously. Right. But we've got to make sure that, and, and it's harder because we're so desperate to hire people right? because we don't have enough staff. So, we have to make sure that we don't lower our standards and hire people that, that might lack integrity uh, yeah. because we don't want to have these incidents like this happen again. But it's it's extremely difficult. Um, but that's really one of the biggest challenges for all leaders is mm-hmm. how do you ensure that everybody's rolling the same way, doing what they're supposed to do? Because you can't be everywhere 24-7. You can't. Right. And, and it's know. such... You know, there's so much distance between you and that person sitting on suicide watch. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can't hold that top person personally accountable. Um, I think one thing that I see in the Bureau of Prisons, and this is just through my career, was a a reaction that always turned into micromanagement. And micromanagement always turns into taking power away from people to make independent decisions. And one of those independent decisions could have been, oh, that guy didn't come back. I need to put somebody in that cell. And I don't know that that's every case, but that was something I saw a lot that I had to work to overcome was how do I empower the people under me to go make a decision 
You know, I, I worked with a captain for years, said, uh, uh, don't be a flat squirrel. And uh, basically said, you know, don't get in the middle of the road and just stand there. Make a decision. Go do something. And it's that empowerment that uh, I think is really hard to do, especially from a level where you were at down to that that base level. So, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and it needs to flow down. Like I felt like, you know, I tried to empower my executive staff and to make decisions and, mm-hmm. and look, I was, I was acting director at, at a time when there was no deputy. So I was kind of doing <laughs> both jobs, right? So, wow. so I was pretty engaged with, with most of the executive staff, um, maybe more so than other directors because I didn't yeah. have that, that uh, deputy underneath me. Um, but hopefully, you know, that, that also meant that I had less time than maybe the deputy would have had for all of them. So, right. uh, so, you know, hopefully they had that time, the ability to empower, but then they need to pass that down to their department heads and to their wardens. And, and, yeah. and that needs to flow down all the way down through the organization. And it needs to become a cultural thing. Yeah. And BOP is getting there, but, you know, it's difficult. It's a, you know, it's a paramilitary organization and yeah. and, and it, it takes time to change that. And, 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 and get people to buy into that culture. Mm-hmm. Certainly I will, and it works. I will tell you one of the uh, leadership skills that I saw in you and that I uh, tried to learn from. Um, and you, you've kind of mentioned that you, you came into this job, not necessarily knowing everything about, well, being a prison officer, right? And right. you would pull people in or you'd come over to my office and go, Hey, how does this work? How have you seen this in your career? And I always saw you reach out and ask questions. And um, I, I assume that you were making decisions at the time, and that's why you were wanting the information. That's something I've tried to emulate more is uh, maybe to have some humility about what I know and what I don't know and reach out to the people around me. And I think you did that. I think you did an amazing job of that. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, that's, you know, you look, you have to, you have to acknowledge that you can't, you look, the Bureau of Prisons is so big. Yes. No one person can know everything about the agency and no mm-hmm. one person can have done every job in the agency. And, and so you have to, as a leader, you have to not only rely on others to do their jobs, but you have to learn from them. And, and look, I'm learning yeah. every day, everything I do and throughout my career. And even today is, is, I'm, I'm learning from other people and that, mm-hmm. and then that uh, influences and, and, and impacts how I act going forward. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, I was doing that in that job. I do it today. I said, you know, you mentioned, I, I, I teach a class at American university and I learn more from my students, I think, than they learn from me <laughs> uh, because, because I, you know, they make me think because they ask questions about, about, you know, um, prisons and how we do things. And it makes me think about, well, maybe there is other ways to do it, or, you know, just in answering their questions. Right. I always, right. Believe that. I always believe when, when new people come on board, I would, I would meet with them. And this was not just at BOP, but at other agencies I'd mm-hmm. meet with new people and say, Hey, you need to ask questions. Your job here is to ask questions yeah. because, because if somebody's explained to you what we do and how we do it, you need to ask, why you need to ask so you understand why because if you don't understand why then you're not going to carry it out well and Mm. and by asking those questions then that challenges the people that are there that you're asking to think about well is this the right way to do it and why do we do it (laughs) right and i would tell absolutely the the only wrong answer is well because that's the way we've always done (laughs) you need to know why you're doing something and, and so it's worth asking those questions because that's how we all learn. So new people yeah. coming in provides this great opportunity for people to learn. And, yes. and we don't, we need to take advantage of that. Wow. No, those are absolutely, that's, that's great advice there. Great advice. Um, so what do you, I know you're retired and, and but you're still an active in corrections and stuff. So what are you doing now? So I tell you now I, I, you know, when I retired, I, I, I wanted. I didn't want to work for any one company. I didn't want to go work for the private prison companies. I didn't want to go work for big consulting firms. I didn't want to go uh-huh. work for people that are selling products, whatever it may be. Um, but 
you know, I wanted to use the experience that I had to see, you know, how we can improve prison conditions, you know, how we can change things for the better. Some of the things maybe that I couldn't do when I was working for the Bureau of Prisons, you know, things that are were hard to change inside, right? What can I do maybe from the outside? And mm-hmm. and so um, so what I started doing now is uh, I work really with all sides of the political spectrum uh, to try and bring attention to to criminal justice, to prison reform, uh, to reentry programming, really, that's really my biggest focus is is on on how we can improve programming and how we can bring programs into prisons uh, so that people come out like I like we've talked about here, uh, better citizens than they were when they went in. And and, uh, you know, one of the things I preach to my students is is, you know, we need to put the right people in prison for the right amount of time. I mean, it's not as simple as just letting people out of prison. It's not as simple as not arresting as many people. It, you need to, unfortunately, the need for prisons is not going to go away. Not anytime soon. Right. Uh, there are going to be some people that, that this country believes that just need to be incarcerated, right? You're, you're not going to let uh, the Boston Marathon bomber, you know, do what he did and then say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, Ah, we're going to put you in a halfway house and, you know, go on with your life. Right. Uh, that's not going to happen in this country anytime soon. But there are people that are in prison that that are probably we could have done something different rather than incarcerating them and would have gotten more value to society by doing so. Or on the other hand, we're putting them in prison for too long a period of time. And I'll give you just some statistics here that just are mind boggling when it comes to this country. Uh, sure. We spend about eighty billion dollars a year incarcerating almost two million people in the United States. Mm. Uh, that is astronomical. The U.S. makes up four percent of the world's population, but we house twenty-one percent of the world's inmates. I mean, why are why are we incarcerating so many of our citizens? One in mm-hmm. seven people in the United States is serving a life sentence. Uh, black people are incarcerated at a rate five times that of white people. Blacks make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but they make up 33% of the U.S.'s inmates. Mm-hmm. 85% of the incarcerated women in this country were the primary caretakers for their children. So what happens to those children when those, yeah. people, when those ladies get arrested and go to prison? One in five people incarcerated in this country have a cognitive disability, and another one in five has a serious mental illness. The United States prison system is the number one mental health provider in this country. Yeah. And I personally believe that's that's just morally wrong. I do and too. We have about 680,000 people. Thank you. We have about 680,000 people returning to our communities every year. And we expect them to be law-abiding citizens. So we've got to do a better job preparing people to return to society safely. Like we said, some state recidivism rates, recidivism rates are at 50%. Hmm. There is nowhere that that would be acceptable in any other industry. So we've got to figure out how we can do things differently. So I'm working with a number of organizations, um, again, across both sides of the political aisle, um, trying to find ways to to write sentencing, um, help help changing uh, sentencing laws, uh, to help finding um, – Reentry programs and things that we can do in our in our prisons, so that mm-hmm. we can be more successful. Change some of that narrative. Change some of those numbers, so that um, you know we're maybe more like the rest of the world because we're not helping anybody by incarcerating people. And eighty billion dollars. I mean, think about this: we're spending eighty <laughs> billion dollars on on prisons. If we could. If we could just get a small, if we took a small number of people and kept them out of prison and could yeah. maybe drop that 80 to 10, I mean, to, to 70, just take $10 billion and put mm. that into uh, mental health treatment programs in the community, a diversion programs in the community, we're, we're better off and as a society yeah. and, and, and as a country. So we've got to figure out a way to, to, reduce the population. We're not going to get rid of prisons. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not believing that that's likely in my life, in my lifetime. 
But right. but if we can work at incrementally reducing the number of people that are in prison, um, we can then provide more resources in the community, and then maybe we can stop people from going to prison in the first place. And, wow. You know, that's right. better for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. You gave us a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I think about every day. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Hey, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, do you have some social media or an email you'd like to leave? I, I am. I'm, I'm on uh, LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, it's not that difficult. Most people, you know, interesting, a lot of people find me by Googling me. They Google my name. And one of the first hits is my American University email address. So I, oh, okay. I'd rather people <laughs> not reach out to me that way, but it is the way people people do it. But but my LinkedIn um, account is probably the best way to reach out to me. And, okay. uh, and you can find me in LinkedIn very easily. That sounds good. Well, I thank you so much for being here and giving us some insight into that. I think that was a, a great conversation. I'm glad we got to have that. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. No, it's good to be here, Mike. I really appreciate it. It's great to catch up with you. Yeah, you thank too. You. Have a great day, buddy. Thank you. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.